In keeping with the theme of today's event, that's the title I chose. Inventor, and I've been an inventor, and I can safely say that because I have got a lot of inventions that I can talk about. And uh, before that, I'd like to tell you a lot about my childhood, actually, because it started way back then. And for an inventor, being inspired is something that we survive on. We need to be inspired, and with inspiration, we can take it forward. So, uh, my life started pretty early. The first uh, in, uh, sort of inspiration that I can actually remember as having inspired me really well was a clock, and that's a clock made by John Harrison. And he was an, a clockmaker, a British clockmaker, who in the 1700s built that clock, and it's so exquisite. I still I, that left me inspired for life, and it's left many people inspired for life. In fact, uh, Einstein said, "If only I had known, I would become a watchmaker." And you can see why. So, this is this uh, was an uh, English reader in fourth or fifth grade, I think. And I've been passionately fond of clocks ever since. Uh, my parents were not very affluent when we were growing up, and so we had to entertain ourselves, make our own toys. That little toy is something that I used to make and gave uh, me hours of pleasure. And since it was very basic, you just had to wind it up, a rubber band reel, piece of candle, broomstick. And we had to be innovative to make variants of this thing. And uh, there were many variants over the years, and it, it was something that taught us to be creative and to be industrious. And in school, I spent all my spare time in the library with encyclopedias and stuff like that. I, you, know, you learn so much from encyclopedias, inventors, their lives, inventions, technology, general knowledge. And this is a collection from my personal collection from the 1930s, and it just shows you how far uh, technology and life in general has moved from the 1930s to now. And I also had, uh, maybe in the fifth grade, a, a science teacher, Rajkumar Roberts, I remember. And he taught me electronic circuits. In those days, nobody, did, uh, none of the kids knew anything about electronic circuits. So I learned uh, circuits, circuit diagrams, how to design an etched circuit board back in fifth grade. Later, I had another friend, Roland Dineto. That guy was an absolute wizard at electronics, a few years my senior. And uh, he was responsible for bringing in these first uh, body scanning machines and scanners in general into the country. So I was exposed to a very high level of electronics and I got to learn and study under him. So he became my friend, mentor and guide and remains so to this day. And uh, this is a little funny thing that I want to tell you about. In high school, Skylab was coming, going to crash down to Earth. I don't know how many of you know about Skylab, but it was a big space station and it was going to come crashing down to earth and I was hoping that a piece of it would fall in our garden. I just <laughs> desperately wanted a piece of Skylab. But anyway, that didn't happen. So I decided I'd make a three-stage rocket and I actually made a three-stage rocket and then it was a bit scary to set it off. So I took another friend of mine, Dale Sequeira, that guy had a lot of courage or oh, maybe he didn't, but <laughs> he decided to light the fuse. So we went to a cemetery nearby and uh, set up the rocket and Dale very bravely went and lit the fuse, I hid behind the tombstone. <laughs> that is a safe place to be, you can, because this rocket, when it went off, went push, I mean like crazy, there was fire and smoke and all that, but it was too heavy, it didn't lift off the ground. And then the first stage blasted off and it separated successfully, which was amazing, but then the rocket went slowly and began to teeter around like that and then it came straight at us and we were ducking behind these tombstones. Uh, Till two, two more stages had to blast off, which we had to wait which was quite some time. Almost a minute of waiting we had to do it. So that was some really fun times we had uh, in experimenting and enjoying ourselves. Now, my first job assignment took me to a factory that was processing gherkins, these little cucumber things that uh, they pickle and export. And uh, they had a giant pig machine, 50 feet long, and I was very fascinated with this machine. and. Uh, what I wanted to do was make a machine, uh, I said I volunteered to make a machine that's smaller than that. I said, why do you have this huge machine? They said, that's all that we have, uh, there's nothing else. So I said, I'll make a machine that's small. And so I made this machine and it did the job. And that was the start of uh, a whole industry where this became the entry level machine that would, would do all their processing. And we started, many companies actually bought this machine and uh, I did make some money from it. Now this guy John Harrison, he's still in my, on my mind and uh, they made a movie about his life if you get a chance to watch him. And uh, I had started collecting antique clocks and restoring clocks and watches and stuff like that. And so 
uh, round about that time, uh, I met another friend of mine and was collecting socks, uh, Dr. Pipet. Now, Dr. Pipet was a medical doctor and he did the most natural thing any doctor would do. He chucked up his profession and he went into a garage and started restoring old clocks, watches and two vintage cars. And we had a really great time. He was a friend for many years. But sadly, Doc contracted cancer and then his last commission was a grandfather clock which he handed to me. And so, I ended up making that grandfather clock and those are my neighbors posing with it. And uh, the day it was completed, we went to hospital and Doc was very ill and told him about it. He ran through all the specifications of whether I did what he asked me to do and he was very happy. And so, we came back home and then two hours later, his son calls me to say, Doc, no more. But true to my association with this really wonderful man who dared to be different, he chose to chuck up his medicine and follow his dreams. Uh, really the most inspiring person I've met and a delightful, absolutely perfect man, I'd say. Uh, led me to my first horological invention. Now, any challenge, mechanical, will, I can invent just like that. And it's a problem, it's an obsessive compulsive behavior. So, it's, it's serious, I'm not joking. So, so, this contest came up, Breguet, the Swiss watchmaking company, uh, had a contest and they were celebrating the 250th anniversary. So, I had a contest. So, I invented a perpetual calendar. It has no levers, unlike um, others, and it's all rotary in design and it was published in Horological Journal. And uh, then, the same Horological Journal had another uh, article where they had a large date mechanism. This mechanism that actually produces the date maybe almost four times is larger than in a normal watch window with little complicated counters and what's unique is that the counters you have two different they said uh, asked invited readers to explain if they could figure out how that mechanism worked and so i ended up inventing three large date mechanisms and then there were more patents than i could deal with it actually became a nuisance to have so many patents uh, if, if patents are an objective, then you miss the then you miss the mark. If they just happen to be a necessary evil, then it's okay. But this is becoming you know every every challenge resulting in a patent new invention. Well, one of them was successful as far as being little commercial. But anyway, dumb. so I stopped inventing as a, to every I control myself rather, and uh, I uh, it, it is necessary. You have to make a conscious decision not to respond to every challenge with a solution. So, this is the cover of one of my favorite books, it's called Inventions That Changed the World, published by Reader's Digest. And while I was thinking about the topic of what I was going to speak about to you today, the innovations and things like that, I wondered what, and I'd like you all to think about this, this word innovation is used for everything, innovate, 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 but I wondered what it would be like if that title of that book became The Innovations That Changed the World, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's not apt. And so I checked on the meaning and it's definitely not apt. There's a very, very big difference between an innovation and an invention. And for all of you all tech people, please get this in, uh, definitions clear. An innovation is basically a better and a newer use of an idea, whereas an invention is the, con the, the actual creation of the idea itself. So you can innovate if you have an invention or if you have something to innovate with, but for an invention, you start with nothing and you produce, you create something. So once you've got an invention, you may tweak it and innovate. But to actually innovate, you need to have something to start with. And if you, uh, the same thing in this book, another, uh, there's an essay in the beginning and this guy, Gordon Rattray Taylor, he talks about a, a, a catchphrase that's often, often used and he says, necessity is the mother of invention. And he goes on to say that, judging from all these inventions in this book, that, invention, that necessity is not really the mother of invention, but invention, but invention is the mother of necessity. And if you think of it, it's true. Take Steve Jobs, his iPod, iPhone, Apple Mac. None of those were necessities before he invented them. We didn't know they existed before he invented them, so they couldn't have been necessities. After he invented them, then they became necessities. And so, uh, there's one more little thing about uh, the difference between an innovation and an invention. I'm bringing this example because my present invention is a Braille display. And this guy, Louis Braille, when he invented the Braille script, he could have just taken any script and just added a tactile component to it. Maybe with some sticky gum or sand or like icing sugar or something like that. But he didn't. He invented a totally new script. And that is the difference between an invention and an innovation. And that makes a very big difference long term. Okay. And uh, 
Now coming to my present invention, uh, it deals with visual impairment. This problem has occupied four years of my life now, or maybe five. Uh, visual impairment, there's 37 million people, blind people around the world and 15 million are in India. Some statistics say that more than half of the blind people of the world are in India, which I think is more accurate. And uh, so one of the biggest problems is literacy for the blind. And uh, some statistics say in the 1950s, lit Braille literacy was 50% and now it's dropped less than 8%. The problem is that without literacy you go nowhere. Now these are my friends Sabria and Paul and many of you all have met, uh, met them over here and had the privilege of meeting them. That's my friend Chandana and today's Chandana's 19th birthday. She also lost her sight like Sabria around about the same age. But she's an exceptional girl. She decided to get literate. And so while learning music, her music teacher who happens to be blind also, Ruby, another exceptional woman, taught her Braille to help her learn music. And uh, she realized that with Braille script, she could actually take notes in class. And this little recorder was not really doing a good job because recording and listening is not the best way to get educated. So with this, with this script, you can actually take notes. And so she's been doing that and right now she's in the middle of her exam. But in spite of being braille literate, she has to take a scribe. And the scribe will read her question paper and to her and then dic uh, write down what she dictates her answer, which is not the best way. And she's one of the literate few. And she could have got her question papers in braille, answered in braille and had them evaluated in braille if braille literacy was what it should be. And this invention of mine is a refreshable braille display. That's the proof of concept prototype. Has 600 pins. And these little pins actually take information from the computer and actually produce braille. So you can get all the libraries of the world, the things that influenced and inspired me, all the stories, available in braille if you have a device like that. Because that's the monitor for, a, for a, someone who's blind, a braille display. And there's a very interesting story. I'll tell you about it because uh, the, uh, this should give you hope, those of you who are engineers and things like that, which I'm assuming most of you are. Uh, this, was con this whole invention was conceived in ignorance. Five years ago, I didn't know a single blind person. I didn't know anything about Braille. I didn't know anything about music. And uh, I didn't have any background education course, nothing to do with visual impairment. But uh, what happened was, I was trying to understand music. I like music and one of my favorite things comes in this movie, The Titanic. Just before it thinks there's three violinists who play this exquisite. And then I said, if these dots can come out of the page, then someone who's blind would be able to read music. And the next step was, I don't know how that's uh, It's gone, gone to the other script, okay. That was the, the actual lyrics of the hymn. But what happened was the, the music in my mind turned into braille. And while this invention is not about converting uh, uh, or making a machine to help the blind read music, it can do that. But it's actually a display that would make braille available, any digital information available off a computer. And this is a little video that demonstrates those, those, each of those pins must be able to withstand 15 grams of finger pressure on them. And if you look carefully, you'll see the pins moving around. And I've got this device with me there. And what it does is, it takes it and produces it. I, I had some very encouraging people tell me it cannot be done. If it could be done, someone else would have done it long ago. And then there were even more encouraging people in the industry who said, oh yeah, it's a good idea and all that. But uh, it cannot be done at Braille scale. And so, and it's too expensive and things like that. So I had a lot of, and those are the actually absolutely perfect things you could say to me. Because when I am challenged, I respond immediately with an invention. I don't take it as, I never discouraged with someone challenging me or telling me that they can't do something. I just respond immediately with an invention. So I actually produced the proof of concept to show them that it could be done, not really that. that it, and then they all vanish. And so <laughs> the government of India strangely came up and they said they'll support this project to its logical conclusion. And that's the stage that it is at now. I made, started converting everything into plastics and moldable stuff and low cost stuff because basically my target was that a single line version cost 6,000 euros as of now and so it's not even affordable to most in the West. But uh, what I'm aiming for was a $500 ceiling for a multi-line version so that it would be affordable to people in India But I, and I think we can more than make that mark. Two months ago, I have to thank my friend Kumar, I don't know, he's somewhere around here. Uh, and 
three or two, four, three out of the four years was in Velour, strangely enough. And strangely enough, we've all put in touch with each other, including me with Velour and thing, by an American scientist who said you all must get in touch. And through a very strange set of circumstances, we all got met each other and uh, this project has taken up. Without whom, it would have taken maybe 10 years to get through. But it is really nice. So in, I've been really privileged, privileged to work with these, this visually impaired community. I mean, I've been so inspired. There's so many things. There, there are a few inventions in with you know, currency checkers and things like that. I haven't brought them with me, but and I couldn't include them in the slides for lack of time. But uh, those are some additional inventions that uh, are there. I don't know, Kumar might have it with him. But uh, uh, I'd say these people are the most inspiring people I've met in the last five years. And uh, I'm, for them, I'm challenged to do my best. And they, des <coughs> they deserve nothing less. And before I close, I'd like to quote from Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison said, I've never worked a day in my life. I've had, just had fun. And that's why, that's the title of my thing. I had the same, I can say, ditto to Thomas Edison. Thank you. And, and God bless.